Welcome to the briefing. Happy Friday, everyone. I have just two quick items at the top. Uh, first, a quick travel update. The Secretary, as you know, was in Saudi Arabia where he met with King Abdullah, also met with uh, President Jarba, the SOC, of course, and is on his way back to Washington. I think en route to Shannon right now, and then we'll be on his way back. And I uh, would like to welcome the group in the back of the room. We're welcomed today by 20 Pakistani broadcast journalists who have spent the past month working in newsrooms across the country. Wave, hi. <laughs> uh, they've spent the past month uh, working in newsrooms across the country as participants in the U.S.-Pakistan Professional Partnership in Journalism. Since 2010, more than 180 Pakistani journalists have come to the U.S. on this exchange. 30 Americans have traveled to Pakistan for reciprocal programming. This is one of the many exchange programs sponsored by the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs that support the Department's commitment to promoting free and open press around the world. And thank you so much for being here today. Hopefully we'll have an a in instructive and lively briefing. Oh, so with I'm that, sure Matt. I'm sure that we will be able to produce that. <laughs> um, I, before we get into other things, I got two really quick that may or may not be breaking. One, are you aware of a shooting incident with uh, Mexican law enforcement authorities shooting into Arizona? I am not. Okay, good. You, uh, maybe something, it's, it's yeah, one, we earlier can check, today. But and then the second thing is, is there any update on Miriam Ibrahim in Sudan? I just have a quick update, and I know we sent around one last night as well. Uh, she was released yesterday by the Sudanese police on bail. The family has been taken to a safe location. Uh, for their safety, we won't be discussing the family's location from here. Uh, we are in communication with the Sudanese Foreign Ministry to ensure that she and her family will be free to travel as quickly as possible. And again, uh, we uh, believe that she and her children have all the necessary travel documents to allow them to enter the United States. Uh, and, uh, okay, well, the, her lawyer says that, she, that, uh, that they're at the embassy. You for for cannot, safety you reasons, we won't, we won't okay. uh, be commenting on specifics from here. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll let someone else go before we get back into Ukraine. Seed the ground. Who's next? Okay. Yes. Saeed, I'm looking at you. Okay. And Saudi Arabia, can you at least update us on what possibly they, they may have agreed to? Is it that they focus on Iraq or that they focus on Syria? I mean, things do, seem to be, you know, mixed up because he met with Jarba. They announced the $500 million in, yeah. in aid and so on. So if you just bring us up to date, on, up to speed. Yeah, well, in terms of the meeting with uh, SOC President Jarba, just a quick readout, talked about our ongoing efforts to strengthen the moderate opposition. Uh, President Jarba thanked Secretary Kerry for the President's recent request yesterday to Congress for additional funding uh, to train and equip vetted members of the armed opposition. Secretary Kerry encouraged President Jarba to continue to take steps to reach out to people within Syria to continue to expand the leadership of the opposition. Uh, finally, they also discussed the threat from ISIL, of course, not just to Iraq and Syria, but to all countries in the region. Uh, Secretary Kerry provided President Jarba with an update on his meetings in Paris, the ones he had with the foreign ministers from the region, uh, and reiterated the shared commitment to a political solution to the crisis in Syria. Uh, with King Abdullah, I don't have a fuller readout yet, but I know they talked about Iraq, certainly. Uh, our efforts against ISIL uh, and to support the Iraqis as they form uh, an inclusive government. Also uh, talked a little bit about Syria and the recent uh, request as well. Seeing how uh, these groups, these militant groups, moderate or otherwise, find, you know, morph into something like ISIL or potentially morph into something like ISIL, is it really wise to provide them with $500 million worth of aid and equipment? I mean, you know, because that is, you know, th th these are fungible groups that go from one to the, to the other. That's true. Uh, so a few points on that. To mitigate the risk uh, of assistance falling into the wrong hands, uh, all of the moderate units that are receiving or will be receiving our assistance are vetted through our formal process. We have a process in place and are coordinated with the Supreme Military Council as well. So uh, this is one of the things we've always talked about, right, vetting who we give this to. And we've, that's also why we've said, look, we need to be very careful and deliberate as we decide who to give assistance to. So we give it to the moderate opposition and are very clear uh, about the fact that ISIL and Nusra uh, are, of course, terrorist organizations, and we don't uh, want anything to fall into their hands. And yeah, just yesterday, the, uh, the Free Syrian Army handed over without a fight, without firing a shot, a, a town called Abu Kamal, Abu Kamal, you know, which is Al Qaim on the, on the Iraqi border, without firing a shot to ISIS. So, 
Do you have any well, comment on that? Well, I'm not going to give, I think, a, a is battleground that, update. The isn't that the moderate uh, opposition that Well, you we know about? the situation is complicated on the ground, and that's exactly why we have said we are going to provide additional assistance uh, to train and equip uh, the moderate vetted Syrian opposition. We know uh, they need more resources. We have been steadily impro increasing excuse me, our resources to them. As you know, last year we increased uh, our assistance both in the scale and scope. Uh, President at West Point said we'd be doing more, and you've seen with the announcement last night or yesterday afternoon that indeed we are going to be doing more. The $500 million is part of that $5 billion that the President spoke about in West Point? Uh, it is. So yesterday uh, we uh, provided Congress with an amendment to the President's FY 2015 request. Uh, this is $500 million for a proposed authority to train and equip. That falls under a request for $1.5 billion, which will be dedicated to a regional stabilization initiative. There's a lot of numbers we're throwing out here. Um, of the uh, $5 billion that we are requesting for the Counterterrorism Partnerships Fund, State will receive $1 billion of it, and the Defense Department will receive $4 billion of it. Uh, a few points on, uh, uh -huh. on this. One, there have been many critics who have been saying for at least two years not uh, not leaving out uh, members of Congress who Why have would said, we leave them out? You know, who have <laughs> said that the U.S. should have been providing lethal assistance to the opposition then and that the only reason why this money is being provided now is because of the intensity with which ISIL is uh, wreaking havoc in neighboring Iraq. Is it because of ISIL that this administration has decided to provide aid that before now it had said, for the same reason, we don't know who's going to actually mm -hmm. control this equipment and we don't want to take the risk of it having, having it fall into mm -hmm. the wrong hands. Well, a, a few points. First, uh, ISIL is only one part of the decision to provide this assistance. So uh, overall, uh, we have a number of goals with this assistance, of course. Uh, building the Syrians' capacity to help secure and stabilize Syria, also helping the moderate opposition defend civilians against attacks by the regime and by extremists. So by both, really, the threat is clearly coming from both. To counter terrorist threats, to stabilize areas under opposition control, that's obviously an important component of this, and help facilitate the provision of essential services. So also, uh, when we talk about things like humanitarian, when we talk about things like getting other kinds of assistance non-lethal to the opposition, this can help secure areas to do that. And, and I think what we've also said is, you know, last year we did announce that we had expanded the scale and scope of our ass assistance. We don't detail all of that. Um, but we have continued to ramp it up. Uh, and, and we do believe this new effort is really complementary to what we've already done and we'll just build on the work that we've already done. A number of military analysts have been looking at the situation inside Syria and they suggest uh, that the Syrian government has regained enough control where it really does have the advantage at this point. So another way of asking the question, is this money coming too late for the Syrian opposition to engage in a fair fight? Well, a as I said, we've been, this is this assistance does not come in a, va in a vacuum, right? We've been continuing to increase our assistance. Again, last year we made a fairly significant announcement when we announced that we had upped the scale and scope of our assistance, and we've been doing that continuously. But we know the, the situation on the battlefield is, is a challenging one for the moderate opposition. Again, not just because of the regime, uh, but because of the terrorist element that is also wreaking havoc with so much of the security. So this is an ongoing fight. We've been committed to standing by the Syrian uh, opposition as they've engaged in it, but we know that they need uh, some more assistance, which is exactly why we're doing it now. This money is going up in a supplemental appropriation, uh, to use the colloquial term. Given that Congress mm -hmm. is out for at least the next week, mm -hmm. and given that there is growing sentiment about uh, U.S. involvement in any sort of conflict in the region, how confident is this administration that it's going to get this funding approved without too many strings attached? Yeah, well, it, it just to, to uh, do a little history on this funding, the language in this request builds on a provision that Senator Levin introduced with overwhelming support from his committee during the Senate Armed Services markup of the NDAA in May. Again, uh, that uh, amendment had, had gotten a large amount of bipartisan support from the committee. 
Uh, so we'll keep working with Congress, but this is something I think they've been interested in doing, and, and hopefully we'll be able to move forward as quickly as possible. So is it reasonable confidence, strong confidence, <laughs> that uh, this money will be appropriated so that well, we people aren't waiting another six months to right. find out? Right, no, no, we, and we certainly have, are working with them. They've indicated uh, support for this kind uh, of support uh, in, in the amendment they had passed to the NDA in May. So, look, we'll, we'll work with them, but we think this is something we should be able to get done fairly quickly. You know what I'm going to ask you, right? I have no idea. Are you going to ask me about the Chinese street right now? Well, yeah, since you're willing to comment on pending legislation having yeah. to do with this, I'm wondering why, uh, you know, what's the deal here? Because very often, more often than not, we don't comment on Except that you just did. Right, sometimes we do. <clears throat> So if it's something you want, then you'll talk about it. If it's something your, you don't Your analysis want, on this while entertaining this week uh, yeah. has, I think, gotten to a point where you're going to get the same answer every time. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but I remember we're going to bring the street up again later. Okay. Just, I'll, if, I'll but make I want sure to go to Ukraine. Well, is there anything else on Syria? On Syria. Okay. And then just we'll go to Ukraine, Matt. Just a couple of days ago, President Obama was interviewed and asked why uh, the administration didn't help the opposition. And uh, he actually said that, uh, the challenge is if you have former farmers, teachers, and pharmacists who are taking up opposition against the battle-hardened regime, it's difficult. It is just a couple of days ago he stated this. Well, it's still difficult. That doesn't mm -hmm. change the fact that we believe it's important to provide this additional assistance at this time. Uh, Those two things aren't mutually exclusive. So a couple of days later, uh, White House stated that five hundred million dollars are going to the uh, as part of a broader opposition. package with some more money. Uh -huh. So many people are confused to reconcile these two uh, statement or the policies. Well, I don't think there's any confusion about those those two statements. The president has made very clear that the situation in Syria is a complicated one, and that as we make decisions about providing assistance, we need to take a, a look at all of the factors including how it could affect the situation on the ground, making sure the folks that we're giving it to are vetted. Uh, those all play into our decision making. So what the President said is true. It is complicated. And when uh, you have a regime with the, both the will and the ability to use barrel bombs, to use chemical weapons as they have in the past, uh, that's a really tough fight. But that's why we're committed to helping the opposition and indeed why yesterday you saw an announcement of additional assistance. So the, yep, just to follow up on the same uh, statement, uh -huh. uh, since the President stated this, uh, there have been a lot of reactions to this, and just yesterday, Washington Post uh, published another piece and saying that the founding fathers of the U.S., Thomas Jefferson was a former uh, farmer, <laughs> John Adams was teacher, and Benjamin Franklin was pharmacist. So... <laughs> okay, well, I didn't see that entertaining piece from the Washington Post, but look, the president has been clear that we support the moderate opposition, which is made up of a whole range of, of Syrians who stood up and said they want a better future. And that's why we've consistently increased the funding to them. Uh, but again, this is a tough fight. I think what the President was saying and was underscoring is that the, the regime has a number of tools they have shown themselves willing to use to put this down uh, forcefully. And that's why we need to keep increasing the support <clears throat> to the opposition. This is just the latest step in that. We think it's an important step. Um, but, you know, I, I don't have much more analysis to do on what the Washington Post may have said, which, of course, I didn't see. When do you, when do you expect this money to be available to, to the We don't have a specific opposition? timeline. As you know, we, the, I think uh, we have to obviously get it approved by Congress, and there are some logistical issues that still need to be worked out, but I don't have a – obviously as soon as possible, but no specific time. Months, uh, years? I don't have even a – no, well, hopefully not years, no, no. But um, uh, I don't have a guess on specific. Just one more on this. The yep. Pentagon said last night that it needs to figure out plans for spending most of the money that's going to be appropriated for yep. this aid and, and training. What is the State Department going to do with its share of the money? We're still uh, looking into that. Obviously, uh, how it will specifically be broken down, I think, is still um, TBD at this point. Our portion of the, the money will, then this is, a, again, a billion dollars, will help mitigate in general, the spillover effects on the neighbors by helping to curb violent extremists, uh, extremism, limit the flow of foreign fighters, will also enable us to bol bolster our partners' civilian counterterrorism capabilities, including law enforcement, prosecution, uh, judicial as well. Uh, so we will be working with countries in the region. With our bucket of money, I'm not sure that we know yet how it will be broken down. But there's no, there's no rough plan? I mean, that I'm, this was there are rough thoughts on it, but we don't have specifics to share at this point. All right. Yep.
Okay, Ukraine. Ukraine. Um, you have seen, and the Secretary put a statement out on the um, EU uh, accession partnership uh -huh. deal accession. I'm not, uh, so I'm not asking about that because we already know what you think about that. Uh, I'm w wondering more specifically about this giving them giving Russia until Monday to mm -hmm. prove that it's willing to, um, you know, honor the or and, and support the, the ceasefire. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you, that the administration? Um, agrees with and are you also going to wait until Monday before possibly doing any new sanctions? Well, uh, just just a few points and just very briefly, one sentence on the um, on the association agreements, you saw the Secretary's statement. I think it is uh, noteworthy that uh, exactly what President Putin was trying to prevent from his uh, interfering in Ukraine has now happened. Uh, and he has, on top of that, a lot of baggage to go with it. Um, and with Georgia and Moldova, I think, happened more quickly than it would have otherwise. So what he was trying to prevent, exactly the opposite happened today. All right. So that, so you would agree then with, perhaps, tell me, would you agree with your former well, predecessor of yours, <laughs> P.J. Crowley, who said that this, these accession agreements are a big win for the West? I think that we absolutely think, uh, look, this isn't about a win for the West. It's about a win for these countries who were able to decide who they wanted to partner with. Right. So uh, but yeah, we do think this is a very good thing. But you don't, you, you, you would not say from the podium that this is a big win for the West, as he said. As much as I would like to always uh, repeat what PJ has said, uh, look, look, I agree with the sentiment certainly. You do. Okay. Well, then, yeah, how can you guys claim then that this is a zero sum game? That, that that it's not a zero sum well, game? That there isn't a cold war? That if you guys, I love are, these questions that you tee up like this. Cheering up. I wasn't sure in anything. You teed it up that way. I said I agreed with the sentiment, but what I said well, first, exactly. wait, what and I said you first, said it was a big deal. What big I said deal. first was that this is a win for the people of these countries okay. who were able to choose who they could trade with more freely, who they wanted to partner with. Uh, it's not a zero sum game. It's not at all. Well, what, it sounds as though people are reacting to it. Well, like I'm that. I'm not going to okay, use those right. words, and I'm not I'm not going to repeat what PJ said. So. Okay, so let's yeah. go to the okay. three days. So the yes, thing. so the European Council did make it clear. They, I think, they laid out some conditions. Yep. Um, we have never outlined a deadline for sanctions, as I said yesterday. Um, we are in very close consultation with them, but obviously we can make uh, decisions at the time of our choosing on sanctions, uh, and we have done so and will continue to do so. But look, Russia has a, a, a standards now it can live up to, right? They've said these are three things you can do. Right. And we're going to see if they do them. But you agree with those things. I mean, you. But they need to do them. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I mean, absolutely. You, you, so, yes. so you are on board with the European Council giving them until Monday to. Well, we certainly agree with the steps they've been asked to take. Again, this is time in the European Council okay. decided on. Uh, we also note that President Poroshenko has extended the the uh, unilateral ceasefire by three days. So some of this timing does match up. Right. Okay. Yeah. But you, but you are in a basic agreement, even though you're not going to be bound. Like you could act tomorrow on sanctions Absolutely. if you wanted to. But, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also note that the four of the OSCE monitors were released, which uh, we also do believe is a good thing. There are still four being held. Obviously, we want okay. them to. Be and released. do you have any comment on the former prime minister's case being thrown? Or, or, uh, Timoshenko's uh, being cleared. I don't. And, I'm happy to see uh, if there's anything going on. Now, uh, last week, and again um, this week, both you and Jen were very dismissive of these reports of thousands of people fleeing yep. um, Ukraine into Russia. I'm going to be again today, but uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, yeah. Well, last Friday, in response to my saying, my question, which was, have you have seen nothing like this, that there is no mass exodus or even close to thousands that are crossing the border from Ukraine into Russia, fleeing their homes? And Jen replied, correct. And then I asked again on Monday, you, and I said, it's still your understanding that reports in Russia of enormous amounts of refugee flows are incorrect. And you said, incorrect, yes. Well, today, the UN Refugee Agency comes out in Geneva and says that 110,000 Ukrainians have fled this year for, uh, for Russia, fled Ukraine to Russia, and that 54,000 have fled their homes in Ukraine but have stayed in Ukraine. I'm wondering, were you guys just completely misled by the Ukrainians and by We the, don't think those the, numbers are credible. You think that the, that right. the so UN let's, let's Refugee Agency is Let's talk about this a little bit. Let's wrong. talk about this a little bit. Okay. There, look, it is certainly likely and probable, right, that some thousands may have crossed the border. There's been quite a bit of border crossing both ways, we should note. So there's been a, people go back and forth quite frequently. Um, this is, a, as we've now seen, fairly porous border. So the notion that there may be 
you know, some thousands that have crossed is certainly probable. Um, that what we're saying is not credible is the notion that there's 90,000, hundreds of thousands that are fleeing from Ukraine to Russia. We just have seen no evidence to support that. We don't believe they're credible. We're watching. We're monitoring the situation. And obviously, this is, you know, it, this isn't a science. This is an art in some respects because you can't have people all along the border. But we just don't think that the hundreds of thousands number is credible. We well, don't have no, anything to corroborate it. But it's not hundreds of thousands. It's 110,000. That. 100,000. We don't, we just don't have anything to corroborate that but, or, or show I mean, that it's credible. Okay, so, so, so you We don't do, have our own evidence. Okay, fair enough. But then you, that's understandable. But this is the UN. This isn't the Russians saying this. This is right. the United I, I'm Nations. I'm not saying talk. there's This is an agency thing. that you guys give millions and millions of dollars right. to, and they're now no longer credible. We don't have anything to back up that number, Matt. Well, but you cite UNHCR and you cite the UN Human Rights Commission on plenty of things that you have no, don't have your own evidence to back up. I, I don't think that's necessarily true. Well, um, yeah. when we use numbers from people outside agencies, I think we tend to back them up with our own analysis as well. But on this, we just don't have anything to corroborate. This, you know, the you do so that when, when when they say something about North Korea, where you have absolutely no idea what's going on, you don't have anyone would, on the I ground. I would take issue with a little bit. Have absolutely well, no idea what's going on. Yeah, but on. You, there's no way that you can back up World Food Program statistics on hun hunger or malnutrition in North Korea on your own. You just take them and you accept them as as well, credible I, I think because you're they come some from the UN. Generalizations about I'm wondering how we do why, is it something with the UN refugee agency no. that you don't believe? What, no, I, again, we've seen numbers thrown around by a number of people, including the Russians. We don't have any, we don't think that those huge numbers are credible. We don't have information to back it up. So until we do, you know, I, I'm not going to stand up here and, and make assumptions without having facts. So, so we'll, we'll keep looking I mean, at it. And, and again, some would argue that, that, you, that, that, that by, but by, that you're doing that already. Well, no? I'm happy to have that argument with someone, whoever that someone might be. But my point is, look, as I as I said, I conceded the fact that there are numbers of people who do travel back and forth. Yeah. Uh, it's a very poor sport. There are families that have contacts on both sides. So right. I can't rule out the possibility that even up to thousands of people have crossed one way or the other. Okay. Um, but this notion that there's 100,000 Ukrainians who have fled in mass uh, to Russia, we just don't believe is credible at this point. We're looking into it. I'm not ruling it out entirely f for eternity that we ever could get to that assessment, but we just don't have anything to back it up. Okay, but I, do, is there anything else? Can I ask, do you have doubts about the UN High Commissioner for Refugees on other uh, We don't. In other well, situations? This is a this credible is organization. One. Right. It's a credible it, organization, and we're looking into these reports and seeing if we okay. can confirm them. It's a credible organization with incredible figures. We just can't confirm their data on this one issue, Matt. I think you can understand that. Do you think that they have the wrong data, or they, we don't know. they have some sort of a hidden agenda? I don't think they have an agenda, at least I haven't heard of one. We just don't know, and we can't back it up. And we want to be precise before we come out with our own assessment about what we have information on and what we don't. Okay, and uh, do you believe that what happened today uh, should, will give Russia cause to become more belligerent? What happened today in terms in, in of what? In terms of, uh, you know, joining the trading with the Europeans and all the, the decision to, to do that. Well, no, because as we've said, uh, look, it's up to the people in these countries to decide their futures. Russia has a path forward here that European Council and others have laid out for them, steps they need to take, uh, and we hope that they take some of them. So you think this will give them pause to sort of take a look back and, and maybe, well, you know, We certainly hope beyond, it does. Okay. We certainly hope it does. Yeah. Ambassador Enlik resignation. Yes. Uh, we uh, we saw the secretary's statement. We didn't see uh, the word resignation or resign. Why? Right, because you all like to use words that aren't always accurate. Why he didn't resign today? Well, he will technically, I think, probably have no. Yeah, yeah. The AP headline, particularly the term "quit," I think, is a little negative in tone. Um, but yes, he, he will. Huh? Well, now one, I don't write headlines, but two. I know you don't. I know you don't. Wait, just he, going back to that, he will be. It also means to leave, you know? Well, it has a negative connotation. Well, it isn't intended to be negative. Okay. Um, he will be leaving his post here. I, I'm not sure bureaucratically, uh, technically, what he has to do, whether that's submit a letter of resignation. It probably is. Um, but he will be returning to the Brookings Institute. Uh, Frank Lowenstein, who many of you know, who has worked for the Secretary for a decade now, was his Chief of Staff on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and has been very involved in these negotiations, uh, will be serving as the Acting Special Envoy. Ambassador Indyk will continue to work closely with the Secretary uh, on, on these issues uh, from his position at Brookings. So what was the reason why? 
as a paid advisor no, or no, just not I'm, to my knowledge is he I don't believe he's going to be paid so, so then he that, did resign I mean I think he probably will technically have to yes uh, so he didn't, he didn't, uh, why he's not taking a leave of absence let me check on the bureaucratic paperwork here well, okay well, well, uh -huh. why do you think he stayed long time after the failure of the peace well, negotiations we're, we're in a pause the right now and the Israelis no it, it took him more than two months to resign or to leave right. his position. But that's why I said we're in a pause in the negotiations right now. And I think he's been working intensively with the parties to see uh, if they could come back to the table in a meaningful way. And we haven't been able to get there yet. So he will continue advising the secretary on this, but we'll be going back to Brookings for the time being. Can we assume that this was his decision? Yes. The, 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 yes, it was his decision. Yeah. Okay, so So what was his justification when he told the secretary that he would be returning to Brookings. Did well, he say, it was a decision did, they made together. Well, did he say, for example, I keep talking to both sides and neither side is willing to even come back into the same room to well, acknowledge each other's In general, existence? I'm not going to get into the specific language he used, but it's since the negotiations have been suspended, it uh, seemed to be an appropriate time for him to return to his job at Brookings. Uh, at this point, there are no current plans to find a, a permanent replacement for him. As I said, uh, uh, Frank uh, Lowenstein will continue uh, as acting special. Well, there's no well, if there's no plan to find a mm -hmm. permanent uh, representative, does that mean that for all intents and purposes the talks are dead no. and not in a pause? No, nope, I wouldn't say that. Uh, look, the Secretary and, and the President certainly are still committed to trying to make progress here. We're still deeply engaged with both of the parties to see if they can get back to the table. That process is ongoing. It will continue. Um, but again, this seemed like an appropriate time for him to return to, to so his that, well, uh, So why would Frank Lowenstein, if you, what, how can he be acting if there are no plans to find a permanent, you're going to just have a permanent acting person? Why not give Frank Lowenstein the job or just well, not have a special I don't have anything to preview in terms of what might happen down the road. Um, but obviously, uh, if folks remember, Frank was also a senior advisor to the secretary last summer when the talks got restarted, so he's been very involved in the process. So I don't, I don't understand what the point of having an acting is. Why not either give him the job or not have him a job? Well, we'll make decisions about what that job will look like in the coming days and weeks, I think. Could the title of acting is sure. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could you clarify for us if the team is still, uh, is still here? It I is. I mean, David Makovsky, Phil Gordon, I mean, all, well, all the others that are Phil members of the Gordon team. Phil Gordon works at the White House. I understand, but yeah. he was uh, sort of. Uh, he certainly know, works on this issue. Work, right. Yep. The, uh, a lot of the folks you all are familiar with are still part of the team. They're all still okay. working. This is just uh, Ambassador Indyk uh, going back to Brookings. Okay, so although the talks are suspended, the, the team, team is, is still, still in place. place. They're still okay. engaged with both parties. That's why, look, this is, a, this is a pause. It is a tough time. We've said that uh, since the talks did go on a pause, but they're still very deeply engaged. There, is there any engagement ongoing now by there the is. team and the Palestinians and the Israelis? Uh, there absolutely is. We're not going to outline all of it, but there is. Yes, Roz, sorry. Is there, how much credibility can Mr. Lowenstein have if he is an acting person? How much authority can he convey as the interlocutor well, during this as period? As I just said, he was a senior advisor to the secretary when we got talks restarted last summer before Ambassador Indyk came on. So Frank has been deeply engaged with both parties, uh, has very good relationships with the Israelis and the Palestinians. And I don't think uh, our interlocutors always look at the title. I think they look at the person and the relationship they've built with them, and they've certainly built a very strong one with Frank. But certainly wouldn't that uh, having a, the formal job, as Elise was suggesting, make it easier for one negotiator to return to his or her government, as the case may be, and say, the Americans are suggesting that we take a look this, at the issue this way. Doesn't it come with more I don't think the presence weight? of that word in his title affects his credibility or his influence in any way, shape, or form. He's been deeply engaged with both sides, has a lot of credibility with both sides. Again, he was playing uh, the key role with the secretary when the talks got restarted. So I think he absolutely, uh, people know that when he speaks on this issue, he has the full uh, confidence and backing uh, and is speaking for the secretary. This is the second run at trying to broker some sort of peace deal between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Is the administration going to try for a third time? Well, uh, the second uh, effort at this is still ongoing. Uh, while the direct negotiations have taken a pause, our efforts behind the scenes to work with both parties to get them back to the table are ongoing. Uh, it's challenging, certainly. Um, but, but we're still in discussions and we're still in negotiations uh, t talking to them about how they could do that. And one more. The Secretary's mm -hmm. statement alluded to uh, the progress that was made while Ambassador mm -hmm. Indyk was in the position. Mm -hmm. What are they? 
Well, uh, in general, uh, we were able to define the gaps between the two parties on all the core issues uh, in a fairly detailed uh, and significant way. That's something that, you know, we broadly knew before that, but I think this was one of the things we would say uh, was important. You can't bridge gaps until you define them. Uh, also, uh, American bridging ideas were developed in negotiations with the different parties to try and make progress on some of those gaps. Now, again, uh, we are in a pause. Uh, we haven't been able to move forward with that, but these are key parts and components of the process that need to happen in order to eventually get to, to a deal. That's a pretty low bar for saying Well, progress. you're happy to do your own really? analysis on this now. Defining the gaps? You didn't I, I don't know think them for before? the two parties, specifically defining them, specific areas, really drilling down on what those might look like. I do think that for those two parties, sitting down and talking about that directly is significant progress. Really? Okay. So you didn't realize Again, you can before. do your own analysis on it, but I would uh, say that that is Well, progress. let's just take one of the issues, right of return. We're not going to get right? specifics on any of the, the issues. The Israelis say, no way, no right of return. The Palestinians say, we have to have it. There's the gap right there. Well, they say and, something, and they say certain more. things publicly, Matt, mm -hmm. but privately, when you drill down on specifics on all the issues and where the gaps actually lie, those are broad gaps. We're talking about specifics. It's very different. We think there was progress made, but clearly much more work to so do. So you think that you define, so you, you, you think that there was some, you got more information. Uh, you Absolutely. were able to, about every single one of the points of contention. About all of the gaps, yes, you uh, do. And, and, but, and you call that progress? I isn't think more progress, information on gaps is progress, Well, yes. isn't, no, isn't progress actually narrowing the gaps? Well, that's part of what progress will look like, but in any negotiation, you have to define the problem specifically before you can go about narrowing those gaps, and that's certainly what we did here. Well, I don't know, but it just seems to me that, and I think to most of the world, that the problem is, is obvious. Well, but with each of those issues, Matt, it's, it may be obvious to you, but what those gaps actually look like is quite complicated. If it were as obvious to you as you seem to make it seem, we would have done this a long time ago. So while no, I appreciate I your analysis of how simple the situation is, when you get in that room and you say, let's look at these issues, let's look at all of them in detail, those specific gaps and where we cannot come to agreement are what will define the negotiating process going forward. And well, we hadn't done that, that uh, in the current situation until this last round. But th that's not, I mean, I, I'm not the one who's saying that progress was made. You no, guys I are. am. Exactly. exactly. So You're disagreeing with my analysis here. I'm saying, I, I'm not. I'm just saying that I don't see how you can call defining the gaps that you already knew progress. We didn't know them at this level. Low, of, Apparently we so, we or non-existent. <laughs> <laughs> I just, we didn't, I'll, I'll we didn't just, know the specificities. Wait, wait. We didn't know the specificities at this level in all of the issues. No, we had not had those specific level conversations with the two parties in the same room for a long time. Since you, Camp David? Yep, Saeed. Not to belabor the issue, but if the talks, should the talks restart yep. anytime soon, will you have to start all over again or will you begin? from where you ended. Well, the goal certainly is always to build on the I'm, progress I'm, you've no, already I made. Mean, what is the perception? That you will begin from where the talks ended or you, will you begin anew? Well, again, those discussions are going on right now, what it might look like if the parties come back to the table. to be a round of talks. They start all over again. I mean, you know, are you closer, let's say, on Jerusalem? Are you closer I'm not going to go any, into itself? any of the specifics on the issues. I think we've exhausted this topic. Yes. Uh, uh, in his statement, uh, Secretary Kerry has said that the United States remain or remains committed not just to the case of peace, but to, re to resuming the process when the parties find a path Absolutely. back to serious negotiations. Uh, does this mean that uh, um, Mr. Lowenstein will be waiting for the two parties to find a path forward well, he, we're to, working to with call him to back to the region, path. or he will initiate a plan? Or Well, oh, in terms of his travel, well, we're engaged with the parties, whether it's from here or on the ground, uh, to try and get them back to the table. Beyond that, I don't have any more specifics. Yep. Uh, sure. On, um, on Frank's position, uh -huh. something he's acting. Is he going to be dealing with other with other issues as well? Is he going the to Middle be East peace? The Middle East peace. Not to my knowledge. Just fully no. Not to my knowledge. Can I? I think uh, that's enough for for one person. <laughs> can I ask about? Um, this is a little off topic. About Cutter, about mm -hmm. the case of um, Matthew and Grace Huang. A few months ago, you said when they were convicted um, and sentenced to three years in prison. You said you were surprised and disappointed by the trial's court decision. Um, you had concerns throughout the trial that not all the evidence was weighed by the court. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you have an update on this case, what you're doing to try and 
uh, make I have sure no that they receive any. I'm happy to check. That was several months ago. I'm happy to check and see what the latest is. Well, I mean, you know, the, I just don't know what the latest. I is. understand, but this department and the building has kind of spoken out on unfair trials around the world. And we about spoke out on this are, one. Well, I don't, I don't think as fully, maybe as. Well, I, um, I think that statement you read for me was pretty. Pretty, uh... Well, I mean, if you're so... These are American citizens now. These aren't, Uh you know, people from another country. And we said we had concerns with the trial. We were working with the government of Qatar to express our concerns. If you could take the question what you're doing with to um, address the concerns with the government of Qatar. I'm happy to see if there's an update. Thank you. Yes, can we go to North Korea? Yeah. Um, I wanted to know if you can today offer any independent confirmation of the projectiles launched by North Korea. We don't have anything new on that. Still looking into what those may have been. Nothing new. Another issue? Oh, wait, wait. Stay on Today, maybe you can try again to comment Nothing on the... Nothing new on the video, on no? the movie. On the movie? Sorry. Okay. Uh, Pakistan? Yeah. Uh, question for uh, our colleagues in the back. Uh, since they have left <laughs> Pakistan, a lot has happened there back home. And they may be aware of it is Pakistan. What uh, some people in Pakistan are saying that Pakistan is burning today, politically, civil unrest, and counter-terrorism, terrorism is going on, Taliban and so forth, and hundreds of thousands of Pakistanis are refugees in their own mm-hmm. home town because of this fatah, and they are running around the country, and they are uh, saying that not much has been going on as far as taking care of their food, shelter, and medicine, and so forth. Mm-hmm. My question is, what message do you have for our colleagues back home here, <laughs> and also for the Pakistanis back home, and mm-hmm. finally, if U.S. has been asked for any help to Uh, help these people, uh, refugees? Well, a a couple points on that. Uh, First, as I talked about yesterday, in terms of the clearing operations in North Waziristan and the Fatah, it's an entirely Pakistani-led and executed operation. Uh, We've long supported Pakistani efforts to extend uh, their writ of government throughout their country and to increase internal stability. In terms of the displaced persons issue, we are closely monitoring the situation in coordination with the humanitarian community. Uh, We do understand that the government of Pakistan is working with the appropriate international and donor organizations uh, to ensure that assistance is in place for displaced peoples and their families. Uh, The USG is a major contributor to such organizations, excuse me, and we stand ready to assist uh, the IDPs in any way we can. And Madam, is is U.S. worried about the instability, political instability going on and civil unrest and so forth because of the old... um, uh, jobs and electricity and other basics are not there for the people. Well, uh, look, broadly speaking, uh, we've said that we are working with the government of Pakistan not just on security issues like our shared counterterrorism interests, but also on education and economic issues uh, and energy issues. We work together on a whole host of of topics. Uh, We know that Pakistan has challenges, but uh, are also committed to working with them. Can I have one on Iraq, Okay. Uh, at least two Indian nurses were beheaded by the ISIR, uh, mm-hmm. and they were serving the wounded and uh, the sick and needy in the hospitals and around the country. And at least 40 Indians are still being held. Mm-hmm. And if uh, Indian government has asked any help from the U.S. or um, what's going Let me check on that. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, obviously, uh, both of the incidents you just mentioned really underscored the brutality of ISIL. Um, this is a group that Al Qaeda has even deemed to be too uh, too brutal for for it, which I think is saying something. So clearly, we know there there's huge challenges here. I can check on that specifically. Okay, on Iraq, this has uh-huh. we have asked this for a while, but are you aware since Vienna? I mean, yeah, Vienna and Deputy Secretary Burns meeting with the Iranians on the Iraq issue. Are you aware if there have been any? I'm not, but let me contact? let me double check. I am not. The reason but, I ask is because the Pentagon now says that yes, it is flying drones. Okay. And the Iranians are also flying drones. And I'm just wondering it, what the mechanism is to prevent these drones from flying into each other. I'm happy to check and see if there's anything we can share on that. Okay. Any I would, the Iranians? No, none. Right, but in, term, but in terms of contacts in Baghdad. and I, I'm I happy to check. Better. Not to my knowledge, but I'm uh, happy to check. Different topic? Yeah. Um, uh-huh. Okay. Uh, just follow up on hostages. Uh, there are still eight hostages Turkish hostages mm-hmm. in uh, Mosul as well. Uh, do you have any update on that? I don't have any update on those as well. And on Kurdistan region, uh, last couple of days, both the Israeli officials and today Turkish spokesman, uh, administration spokesman, again talk about the independence of the Kurdistan region and they would uh, support or is 
inevitable. Do you have any change of analysis on the Kurdistan? No change of policy here. We've said that um, a unified Iraq is, is the strongest Iraq and uh, have said that a uh, inclusive government that includes Sunni, Shia, and Kurds needs to be formed as soon as possible uh, to help deal with this crisis. It looks like the uh, ISIL uh, forces are gaining some more momentum around the Baghdad. Do you have any assessment on the we, we don't have a, a detailed battleground assessment to share. Obviously, the threat from ISIL is very serious, and uh, we know that it's very challenging on the ground. We know that uh, units are trying to fight back, but that's why we're trying to provide more assistance to help them do that. Uh, uh -huh. um, is this announcement of the increased funding to the Syrian modern opposition part of a larger deal with the Gulf states? A larger deal? If, if I mean, we United certainly talk to them about our efforts, but... So if we, if the United States kicks in uh, more money to fund the moderate opposition, and this is what the Gulf states had supported, is is the deal for them to take out, take care of some of the financing to some of these groups? Well, that, we're not talking about a, a deal here. Obviously, what we've said is we believe this is in our interest to do, separate and apart from any concerns we have about funding from private citizens that may go to these groups. That is also a topic of conversation with our Gulf partners. Is that part of the conversation with the King today? Uh, I, can, I don't have a full readout yet. Let me check on that. And also, just moving over uh, back to Benghazi, I just wanted to follow up. Okay. Um, do you have any update on a question I asked a few days ago, uh, confirming that consulate computers were taken during the attacks? In 2012? Yes, so I have a little bit, Lucas. Uh, uh, information about our, our computers, excuse me, is largely classified. Uh, but I can say that during the evacuation of the special mission compound to the annex, all classified computers were safely removed by the DS agents no classified information was compromised. Uh, obviously, we have procedures for safeguarding or destroying equipment and information during emergencies. Despite the suddenness and lack of forewarning of the attack, uh, because of the actions of the people on the ground, no classified information, again, was compromised. And what about any computers at the special mission compound? Well, I just said um, all of our classified computers were safely removed by the DS agent. But you said the annex. I said the special mission compound uh, to the annex. Excuse me. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Is that, but does that mean that some un unclassified might have been? Uh, I, I can check on that. I think his question had been about classified information. That's yeah. or, but we're unclassified. I'm, I'm happy to check on that as well. And because um, also, do you have any confirmation that locally employed staff were threatened via text message after the theft? We the are not aware of any specific threats in this instance. Obviously, unfortunately, um, local employed staff do face threats from time to time overseas, but again, not aware of, of anything related. And also, uh, sources in the region have said and insist that uh, Abu Khatala, who is on the USS New York right now and awaiting uh, extradition back to the United States, is a small-time operator. <laughs> Can you comment on that? Well, I think some of those same people uh, for the last two years have been asking us why we hadn't brought him to justice yet. So he clearly is a significant figure. Uh, we have been committed to bringing to justice those responsible uh, for, for the attacks in Benghazi. Uh, there's been a great amount of media attention paid to him, and I just would categorically deny any assertion that he is anything other than significant here. And uh, Abu Bin Kumu, a former Guantanamo suspect, mm -hmm. or Guantanamo detainee, uh, trained in Osama Bin Laden's camps, um, he has been named also as a, a suspect in Benghazi attacks. Are there any updates on the investigation to bring him to justice? Actually, I don't think I have anything new on that. I'm happy to check, Lucas. I don't think I have anything new on okay. that. Finally, uh, I don't. the Libyan landlord that uh, rented out the consulate and the annex to the Americans says the United States owes him money. Is the United States <laughs> planning on making any kind of payments? I hadn't heard that. I hadn't seen that report, so don't. Is, is he a suspect at all in the attacks? I'm not familiar with this. Let me check. Okay. Yeah. Landmines? Yes. Um, just with the U.S. announcement today, I was yeah. wondering whether there was an expectation or hope that other countries would follow through, notably India, Pakistan, Russia, China? Well, we certainly uh, share the goals of the Ottawa Convention, which is what this is all sort of falling under that rubric, um, and have, you know, encouraged other countries to do the same. We know this is a complicated issue. Um, we were glad that we could announce today that we will not produce or otherwise acquire any anti-personnel landmines in the future, and that includes um, not replacing existing stockpiles as they expire. Again, we've been working with a number of countries on this. I don't have anything specific for you on those countries you asked about. Is there a reason why it was made today? I mean, obviously, it's because the, the conference is going on most of the week. But, uh, I think the timing is largely tied to the conference. But, but in terms of the, um, the strategy, I mean, some have argued in the past that 
the North Korean border, that that was mm -hmm. um, an issue for the United States. Have those concerns been alleviated? Well, we know the situation on the Korean Peninsula does present unique challenges when it comes to this topic. Um, we have pursued other solutions that would be compliant with the convention and that would ultimately allow us to accede to the convention. Uh, we've been working very closely with our South Korean ally on this. This announcement does not in any way affect the defense of the Korean Peninsula. But again, we understand that in this particular place there are some challenges we were working through and, and do believe uh, that the announcement today is a good step forward. But if you're pledging that you're not going to replace existing stocks, yep. uh, which means what, if one if one mine is used... As they expire, not right, used. And, well, okay, or we used or expire because right. we can't use them more than once, right? They only blow right, up Right, but once. I also, I mean, we don't, we're not using... Uh, well, I know, mines. well, but, right. but, but, but you, they, expire, they are. Yeah. You are using landmines. You use them on the, the you just said, uh, they're in between the north, the, in the DMZ. Well, right? no. That's well, that's using them. If you talk, right? no, you talk, most people tend to talk about operational employment of them, which is different. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> operational employment? Yeah. Really? That doesn't equate to use? No, it does. That's what I'm oh, saying, but that's okay. not what you're talking about. Right. Anyways, well, that's anyway, your question. Do those expire? Do those have a limited sh shelf life? I'm do assuming they do, but I'm not an expert Well, if they do, and you're not going to replace existing stocks, what do you, I mean, are you hoping that there's going to be a unification of Korea in the next, I mean, in the next couple we of years We have many or tools at our disposal yeah. to defend uh, our South Korean allies. Obviously, uh, we've been talking to them about this. I, I, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just, I guess the question this. is better asked at the Pentagon because well, I, I, I don't know the, how long the shelf life or the. Are you going to make double this, efforts yeah. to, in the next 20 years, to, to defend to our South to, Korean to ally? To unify the <laughs> Korean Peninsula? No, we've said, look, we stand by our South Korean uh, allies. We have many tools at our disposal to help um, defend them. Well, I realize it might be more of a Pentagon question, but the, um, uh, is there still a use for mines on the, uh, on, in the DMZ? Check with the Pentagon on that. I don't have more details on this. And I just want to go back. This this operational employment uh -huh. is that that's the Pentagon phrase? Or is uh, that a, I think it's a technical term. There have been some questions about whether we have operationally employed um, any of these landmines. Uh, and since the Ottawa Convention came into force in 1999, we are or since 1991, excuse me, we are aware of only one confirmed operational employment by U.S. military forces: a single single munition in Afghanistan in 2002. One, we are one, only, one mine. We are aware of one. Uh, okay, but I, I'm just curious about operational employment. Check with the Pentagon. I'm sure plants. they have more details about the difference in in, in phraseology. Okay. Here. Yep. Mm -hmm. Quick question on India. <clears throat> Today is the 30 days. First one month, the new government of India <laughs> uh, finishes, and Prime Minister Modi said that uh, his government has uh, com accomplish more than what the Congress did in last 60 years. Mm -hmm. What my question is, what do you think about this one month, if anything has been accomplished between the U.S. and India? Well, I, I don't think I have any uh, political analysis about uh, comparing uh, his tenure to anyone else's. Look, the Indians are close partners no matter who's in charge. Yes. China. Yep. No, uh, South Korean government announced today the yeah, 27th, uh, President Xi Jinping uh, would visit South Korea officially. It's a state visit uh, on July 3rd and 4th. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, historically speaking, Chinese president have visit, not visited North Korea before visiting South Korea. It is, you know, today, at this time, is kind of un unusual. So my question is, you know, uh, do you think, you know, Xi, uh, President Xi Jinping's visit uh, leads to, you know, that change of the political power balance in Peninsula? Well, we've said that China needs to have good relationships with all the countries in the region, including South Korea. I haven't seen the specifics about the announcement, but uh, I'm happy to see if there's more details we have to share. And, and uh, then how the, the United States expect uh, that both leaders are talking about the Peninsula issues in North Korean? Uh, well, we certainly uh, share concerns that both countries have about uh, the nuclearization of, of North Korea and share the commitment to denuclearizing the peninsula. So I don't have any predictions uh, for conversations we're not going to be a part of, but clearly we've worked very closely with both on this issue. Yes? A quick question on Iraq. Uh, wait, wait, wait. On China? I want to sure. Get in my street renaming question here. Have you received from the Chinese a formal complaint about this uh, proposal? And if you have, um, what, what, what's been your response? 
Uh, I'm not aware of one, but again, I, I can't rule it out. We're still checking with our folks to see uh, if we have. Would you um, would you reply to them that you don't comment on pending legislation? I'm not going to get into private diplomatic communications with them, Matt. Um, yeah. To but use would, another one of your favorite lines. But would you? But I'm not going to tell you how we would reply to them if we had received one, because that's a private diplomatic communication. Uh huh. Yeah. It's driving you crazy today? Yes, Iraq. Mm. <laughs> Me crazy every day. <laughs> It's not limited to today. Well, the feeling is certainly mutual. Yes. So it's, uh, since it's confirmed that Iran is also flying drones over well, Iran. I didn't confirm that, but I know there have been reports to that. Okay. Matt confirmed it for you earlier. Uh, <laughs> do you have any issue, are you taking any issue with Iran is flying Well, we had this, Matt and I have had this conversation this week a few times in this room. Look, what we've said is any actions that Iran or any other country in the region should take uh, should all be used towards uh, promoting an inclusive government, to helping the Iraqi army uh, shore up and be able to fight ISIL. It shouldn't be about uh, promoting sectarian sectarianism or promoting militias. Um, so I'm not going to comment specifically on some of the reports about Iran, what Iran may or may not be doing, uh, other than to say that anything they would do should should we would push them and encourage them to play into this overall strategic goal. Have you been also able to ask the questions regarding uh, U.S. Treasury's fi findings, recent year's findings, that uh, many operatives in Tehran uh, funding and transferring fighters uh, and funds to Syria and to create I, or I don't have anything on that specific issue. Again, if it's a Treasury uh, issue, I, I'd point you to them. And one last question. I couldn't find this quote earlier. Uh, AKP Turkish administration spokesman Hussein Çelik today said about the U.S. when he was asked about Kurdistan that U.S. did not bring peace, stability, unity. They just left widows, orphans in Iraq, and they created a Shia bloc to the south of our country. Well, this is not our country's future to decide. This is the Iraqis. It's the Iraqi leaders who needed to step up after we uh, ended our mission there and give their country a better future. We gave them the opportunity to do so. We haven't seen that uh, take place yet. And what needs to happen now is not blame on any outside forces, but <coughs> looking at the Iraqi leaders and saying, you know, this is a very serious time. You need to come together, and you need to give your country a better future. It's not up to us, the United States, or Turkey, or Iran, or any other country uh, to fix this for the Iraqis. Anything else? Yeah. One more. Last one. Um, apparently. Maliki, Maliki, on his interview with the BBC, said that they're considering buying fighter jets from Russia and Belarus, and I wondered if you had anything about yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, I think they may have already said so, days, but okay. uh, we have said that we don't oppose legal Iraqi efforts to meet their urgent military requirements. Obviously, we're expediting our own assistance uh, and understand that Iraq has pursued military equipment from a variety of countries, including Russia, and I think they've actually purchased some of that the Czech Republic, South Korea, and others. Again, we share a goal here of helping them fight this threat. I think it's like the bureaucracy in the United States that delayed the delivery of, uh, of the Apache. Uh, well, and, uh, as I, I just said, look, uh, we understand the grave situation that Iraq faces, but blaming others is in part what created this crisis. So they need to stop looking at others and start looking in the mirror a little bit more and make the tough decisions they need to. How do you feel that the Russians are trying to kind of usurp you as a provider of weapons? I don't think that's what they're trying allies. to do. Really? They're doing it in Egypt? They're doing no, it in Iraq? I wouldn't. That's not. So. I think a lot of countries are trying to help Iraq. We certainly are trying to do so. And it doesn't bother you that the Russians are selling them at all? To Iraq? Not, not to my well, knowledge. Do you have no. any concern that this hardware might end up in the hands of ISIL, given your lack of confidence in the Iraqi military? Any of our hardware? No, well, the hardware that the Russians Well, are obviously, any country who provides uh, assistance, military assistance to the Iraqis needs to take proper precautions to make sure that it doesn't. Obviously, we're doing that with our uh, uh, assistance that we're providing. Uh, how do, how, how, There's okay. a variety of ways. It depends on who you give it to and who you sell it to. Like and a remote the, control the off switch that took well, place. I, I mean, what? There's just there's a variety of ways to do that. Like but something beyond just like an end user kind of agreement. I mean, you check with the Russians on what they're doing, but obviously we don't want any uh, munitions to fall into the hands okay. of ISIL. But are you confident that the people who are selling this, the countries that are going to be selling this stuff, are taking we'll, those we'll precautions? We'll look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, but I have no indication that they're 
you know, not concerned about it. I think we all share the same concerns here well, and are taking steps to mitigate that. Because, okay, so I just don't have specifics. All right. I, mean, I just, I will just want to make sure you don't have a problem with this because you think that they are taking the proper Well, there are legal to... mechanisms for the Iraqi government to purchase military assistance. And as long as it, you know, falls in those categories and goes towards the goal of uh, promoting, you know, not promoting sectarianism, then broadly speaking, we don't have a problem with that. I, I guess what I'm saying is you, you're not concerned that they're just going to, like, dump all this weaponry into Iraq. I haven't seen Iraq, any indication of that. And then it might be get taken over by, or it might be I mean, I, I haven't seen any ISIL. indication well, of that. the same concerns that you have about your own weaponry. Yeah, right. And I don't have any indications that the Russians aren't, okay. you know, taking steps to mitigate that. Thank Thank you. On this, please, we have Marie, a few more. Will there be any delay on the delivery of the F-16 uh, next uh, fall to Iraq or not? So, no, we're committed, let me make a few points on this. We're committed to delivering F-16s to Iraq as soon as possible. Um, the delivery of the first two has long been scheduled for this fall, pending a, a number of final preparations on logistics mostly for housing, um, securing the aircraft, completion of pilot training. The current situation makes uh, uh, some of those steps a little more challenging, so it's possible that it could be delayed, but we're committed to moving it forward as soon as possible. Current situation, you mean the by fact the that Balad has been taken over by right, the mean, place where they, these jets were going to be based is now in There are some significant of, logistical challenges. Yeah, significant is yeah. An, an understatement. But we're committed so, to doing it as quickly as possible, but we have to deal with some of these logistical but challenges. But there is a possibility for It delay. could be, the timelines could be affected. Well, do, I mean, is the plan still to send them there when they go? I can check with our folks. I don't have the details. Is that me. something that you do, or is that something you're depending on? Uh, I, I'm not sure, because it's FMS. Let me check. Uh, probably comments? a combination. But. Any comments on the Grand Atola Sistani's uh, calling for a new uh, or a pri new prime minister in the next four days, new government? Yes, so we echo today's call by Grand Ayatollah Sistani's representative in Najaf uh, for Iraqi leaders to agree on the country's next le leadership without delay as they prepare to convene the first session of their new parliament on July 1st. It's my understanding he was calling for a process that's part of the, con you know, that's in line with the Constitution just to do it very quickly, uh, which we certainly agree with, because we think the situation has, uh, is so serious that they need to move with urgency. My understanding of what he said was that he actually said that, that, that uh, Maliki had to go. Are, I didn't are see you, that comment. Okay, so I'm not echoing say, that comment. Uh, uh, okay, all right. So I think I was you, very clear about what comments I was echoing of the Grand Ayatollahs. And, and so you are still not prepared to say, or you still won't say, that you, the U.S. wants Maliki out. It's up for the Iraqis. Up for the Iraqis, not but, up for us. But Sistani is an Iraqi. Correct, and, he, and, and I'm happy for the Iraqis to weigh in on who they would like to lead their own country. It's not up to us to weigh in on that specifically. Okay. Uh, finally, one more. Uh, there's a new Pew Research poll out that says 44% of Americans are not proud to be an American, and 56% are proud to are only 56% of Americans are proud to be from this country. Any? I haven't seen that poll, and I would strongly disagree with any of those people who would have voted that way. Clearly. Ah, so with that, thank you very much. Happy Friday, everyone. Thank you.